The Old Testament reading this morning comes from Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1, 3 through 5, and 9, from the New Revised Standard Version Bible. See, a day is coming for the Lord, when the plunder taken from you will be divided in your midst. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, from east to west, by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall withdraw northward, and the other half southward. And you shall flee by the valley of the Lord's mountain. For the valley between the mountains shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. And the Lord will become king over all the earth. On that day the Lord will be one, and his name one. Well, our second reading today is about our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday. And we're reading today from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks in the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. May God add his blessing to the reading of his sacred word. Let's pause for a few moments before we reflect. O oh, gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this most holy of weeks that reminds us of your last week on this earth when you fulfilled your love for us through the sacrifice you made for us. Bless us as we seek you today. Bless us as we seek your presence in our lives. Bless us during this difficult time with hope and with your love overflowing, enough so that we are not only encouraged ourselves, but have enough to share with all those around us. These things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, one day, a farmer was helping one of his cows give birth. The cow and the calf were both healthy, and the birth process was going very well. Just then, however, the farmer's four-year-old nephew, who was visiting him for a week, he walked up. His nephew was from the big city and he'd never seen a cow 
giving birth before. So he stood there wide-eyed beside the farmer, just soaking in the whole event. The farmer thought to himself, Ah, great. How am I going to explain this to this kid? I guess I'll just talk with him about it afterwards. Well, after the successful birth of this calf, the farmer walked back to the barn with his nephew to clean up. Several minutes of awkward silence went by, and the farmer finally spoke and he asked, "Uh, Do you have any questions about what you just saw? Just one, his nephew replied, still deep in thought. He said, how fast was that calf going when it hit that cow? (laughs) That's a city boy for you, you know. But like that farmer, you know, we all get questions that we don't expect. But that's part of life in general, isn't it? The reality that we actually experience differs from the expectations we may have had about what would happen. For instance, you know, we may have expected an exam our teacher planned to give us on a particular day to be easy until after we received the exam <laughs> and we realized we didn't know any of the answers. Uh, or we may have expected to get married at a certain age but things just didn't work out that way. Or maybe to work at a job that we actually loved doing every day and maybe things didn't work out that way either. Or maybe we expected to enjoy good health throughout our life only to find reality for us, for some or all of those things, was different. Or, you know, we may have expected not to have to live through a deadly global pandemic during our lives, uh, to be ordered by the government not to leave our homes for safety reasons, or uh, to have most of the businesses in the country forcibly shut down for safety reasons as well. You know, we may have never expected that we'd ever Google something like, can my dog give me COVID-19? You know, never crossed our mind. Or uh, Google, how can I tell if my favorite goldfish has the coronavirus because I can't take its temperature and it doesn't have a dry cough? See, those questions might never uh, have, uh, we would have expected them to come to our minds only to realize that again reality was different from what we expected. There are many ways, both big and small, when reality differs from what we expected. And when that happens, well, you know, it can leave us feeling anywhere from annoyed to devastating, depending upon the circumstances. But if in those dark moments we can adjust our expectations. If we can look outside of the way we wanted things to be and instead begin to think differently about and to interact differently with the way things are, well, that willingness on our part to adjust expectations can allow God's Spirit to transform our faith for the better during and throughout some of the most messed up times in life. And that is one of the principles we find firmly, firmly embedded in the story of Christ's journey into Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday. See, in Jesus' day, different people had different expectations about the coming Messiah, the person who they believed would bring the Israelite kingdom salvation 
from its oppressors. Like the Romans, for instance, who at the time uh, were the latest regional bullies treating the Israelites like their punching bag. And uh, many of these varying expectations were, were deeply influenced by the prophecy that Marilyn read for us today from the book of Zechariah that described the future arrival of the Messiah. In that passage from the 14th chapter of that book, Zechariah portrays Jerusalem as being surrounded by and uh, attacked by an outside force, which is precisely what happened years earlier, before Jesus was born in 63 BC, when the Roman general Pompey captured the city. You know, for 150 years before that, Israel had experienced freedom, being ruled by their own leaders from Jerusalem. But after General Pompey showed up, they found themselves subjugated, heavily taxed, and suffering in many new ways as the direct result of the Roman occupation. The Israelites were angry. They were disillusioned. They were discouraged. They remembered the way things used to be. You know, uh, people undoubtedly told their children of these stories of, of what it was like to live in freedom. Because they saw the communities in which they lived and the people that they loved ravaged by these outsiders whose only concern seemed to be how much money they could squeeze out of them. To lavish their own leaders in Rome with riches. To build ridiculously large monuments in Rome honoring gods that the Israelites did not recognize to expand the size and the strength of the very army that was making the Israelites' lives a living hell. But because they believed, the Israelites did, that the prophet Zechariah had foretold this nightmare that they were experiencing at the hands of the Romans, they also believed the second part of his prophecy that Marilyn also read today about a promised leader who would deliver them from this distress. I'll read a few verses again in verse 3. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall withdraw northward, and the other half southward. And the Lord will become king over all the earth." That's what people expected. You know, people, uh, different people in Jesus' day, they had different opinions about how the precise details of this Messiah's arrival would pan out. But overall, most expected it to involve the removal of the Romans. You know, this, this force, these, these killers who were tormenting them. Whether the Messiah led some kind of military revolt or the new free Jerusalem itself dropped out of heaven right on the Caesar's head. It didn't matter one way or another. Many expected that the Israelites would regain their political and social freedom once again. They believed it with all their hearts. They expected in some way that the streets of Jerusalem that had been stained with the blood of their loved ones, shed by their oppressors, would somehow all become streets of gold once again in this world. So on that first Palm Sunday, 
When Jesus came humbly riding over the Mount of Olives on a donkey, surrounded by former fishermen, who people knew had been contracted by the Romans to extract fish from local waterways that the Romans would then take and ship to other parts of the empire, removing one of the only sources, or I should say primary source, of of protein for the people in that area. When Jesus came accompanied by these fishermen, prostitutes, tax collectors, and other former miscreants. And people in the Kidron Valley east of Jerusalem began laying clothes and tree branches in front of Jesus, heralding him as the Messiah that Zechariah had promised would come from the Mount of Olives to save the Israelites. Well, there were many others there that day who just didn't buy it. Uh, They were expecting, as Zechariah prophesied, uh, prophesied, that on that day the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, and they didn't think that some guy on a donkey surrounded by people that they thought were a bunch of losers fit the bill. You know, we can imagine people grumbling. You know, there's no way the Messiah would arrive like that with with those kind of people. We don't even associate with those kind of people, so our salvation couldn't possibly come from this guy. Many people before that day, they didn't understand that the teachings Jesus gave, the miracles that he performed, and the sacrifice that he would make in the very city into which he was riding on that donkey, would unleash the opportunity of eternal salvation for everyone who believed. They didn't recognize that Jesus, God himself, on that humble donkey, was accomplishing through his presence and ministry something even more magnificent than splitting the physical Mount of Olives in two, but rather had come, as we read elsewhere in the Gospels, to tear the veil of the temple in two, that curtain that separated humankind from the Holy of Holies in the temple, that place that symbolized the very presence of God. Christ, the Messiah, had come to usher in a new age entirely in which the entire world could be liberated and transformed through his grace. But because Jesus wasn't what they expected as a Messiah, instead of rejoicing like those folks surrounding Jesus did, who so many people thought were losers, and, but who on that first Palm Sunday saw the truth, instead of rejoicing, many others instead felt frustrated. They felt discouraged. They felt devastated. They felt angry and even hostile toward Jesus. They questioned God. How can this be happening? They didn't believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. For one reason, it's because their expectations got in the way. Imagine how blessed their lives could have been. Imagine how God could have transformed their lives. Romans and Israelites alike, if only they had been willing to adjust their expectations. Their eyes would have been opened. And they too could have embraced the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, God incarnate, and the eternal salvation he offered. They too could have been filled to overflowing with his grace. 
But we can learn from their mistake because it's the same kind of mistake all of us make too often in our lives. Every single one of us. You know, when reality doesn't meet our expectations, we too can be blinded by the discouragement or despair or even hostility we feel, depending upon the circumstances, failing in the process to see how God could use our unexpected reality, our unpleasant reality, even something as horrendous as a worldwide pandemic. How God could work something good out of that to transform our faith for the better. To strengthen our faith and to fill our lives with his grace in this life and in the perfect eternity that awaits each of us beyond this world. It was not God who afflicted this world with this pandemic. It is not God who is killing all of those people who are suffering from this terrible pandemic. But it is God who can reach into the midst of that pain in this broken world. And as he does in so many other situations in our life, give us hope and work through something that seemed that there was no hope involved, work through that to give us hope for a new day, and to fill our lives with grace, and to make us stronger on the other side of what we've experienced than we were going in. So as we journey together into Holy Week this year, I believe the events surrounding the first Palm Sunday challenge us to ask ourselves, when my expectations aren't met in life, am I willing to adjust them? When my reality isn't what I expected, am I placing my hope and trust in God, willing to follow Jesus anyway into whatever future he has planned for me? Because we know that regardless of what calamity we're experiencing in the moment brought to us by this broken world, the future God has planned for us is all good. Amen.